thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Joel, I was already introduced, and I'm gonna talk about 10 ways to fizz buzz. Um, so, um, other, apart from my introduction about where I've worked, um, I, I wrote this book called 10 Essays on Fizz Buzz, which just came out, which is what I'm talking about tonight. Um, you may also know me or know of me as the person who does not like notebooks and gave a talk about it at JupyterCon. Um, and I also wrote a book called Data Science from Scratch, which is an O'Reilly book, and it, it's pretty good. So um, these are some of my various claims to fame or infamy. Um, and, and so I'm going to assume that most of you are probably familiar with the problem Fizz Buzz, but in case you're not, it's the following problem. Print the numbers one to 100, except that if the number is divisible by three, instead of printing the number, you print fizz. Um, if the number is divisible by five, instead of printing the number, you print buzz. If the number is divisible by 15, instead of printing the number, you print fizz buzz. And so you know, this is sometimes used in interviews as kind of a lowest common denominator filtering question to, to ask, can you write code at all? And, and so it, it sort of gained this legend as this is the stereotypical bad question to ask during an interview. Um, and, and so, like, why do I care about this problem? Well, about four years ago, I wrote uh, a blog post uh, called FizzBuzz and TensorFlow uh, that was the story of someone who went on a job interview and got a little bit insulted that he was being asked to solve FizzBuzz. And so he decided to solve it using deep learning and kind of show up as interviewer. Um, and so ever since then, um, I've been kind of seen as a, a thought leader in the FizzBuzz space uh, for whatever for whatever that's worth. Um, and so, you know, some people associate me with FizzBuzz um, and sometimes people tweet about me, hey, you should write a book about FizzBuzz because people like this topic of FizzBuzz. Um, and so then, you know, we got quarantined and so I did. Um, of course, this uh, tweet asked me to write a book about a hundred ways of writing FizzBuzz, um, but a but hundred is a lot um, and I, not sure I could have come up with a hundred different ways to solve FizzBuzz, or if I did, they would not have. A lot of them wouldn't have been very interesting. Um, but I was able to come up with ten that were actually pretty good. Um, and what I did is I used each one as sort of the basis of an essay to talk about Python or coding or mathematics or software engineering or design or computer science or so on. So that even though uh, you know the book is on one hand about these problems, it also uh, gives me a chance to sort of wax philosophical about you know, a lot of these topics. And in this talk, I don't really have time to go into the details. Um, and also I want to like tempt you to read the book. So I'm going to talk about the 10 solutions or I'm gonna introduce you to the 10 solutions themselves without necessarily going on long digressions about each one. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll want to know more. Um, and so, you know, can I come up with 10 solutions that are interesting? Uh, I like to think that I did, uh, but you be the judge. And so just, you know, just to remind you, uh, this is the problem, print the numbers one to 100, except it's divisible by three, print fizz. If it's divisible by five, print buzz. And if it's divisible by 15, print fizz buzz. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and we're gonna solve it 10 different ways. Okay, so, you know, the first way is uh, with 100 print statements. This is, this is a solution. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not a good solution, uh, but this solves the problem as stated. Um, it does what the interviewer asked you to do. Um, and you know, if nothing else, it, it, it sort of shows the interviewer what you think of them and what you think of that problem, and you should never underestimate uh, the value of that. But there's nothing really surprising going on here, um, unless you're surprised that this was one of the solutions. Um, the second solution is what I call the if, elif, elif, else solution. This is kind of the canonical solution, um, and this is probably the sort of solution that your interviewer is looking for. Uh, check if things are divisible by 15, then check five, then check three. Um, there are a few things not to like about this solution. One is that it's kind of order sensitive. So if you don't check the mod 15 first, uh, you'll get it wrong. Um, it also requires you to know the modulus operator. Some people object to it on those grounds, thinking that many, you know, you could be an advanced programmer and not know the modulus operator. Um, and then some people just don't like the four branched if, else, 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 which they find distasteful or unesthetic or something. But th this is, you know, this is the solution that your interviewer probably would be expecting. Um, you know, but if you do know the modulus operator and you start thinking about the problem in terms of modular arithmetic, um, you know, you may start to appreciate that there's a deeper mathematical structure that underlies uh, this problem. 
Um, and so this is what I call the cycle of 15 solution. Um, and what I like about it is that it starts to hint at that underlying structure of the problem. And, and if you look at it, it might take you a second to figure out what's going on here, but we have uh, basically a list of 15 things and we mod n by 15 and then just take the, the relevant entry in the list. So, so this is maybe a slightly unusual solution. Um, it's not super complex, but it's, uh, it hints at something more going on here, which, which I like. Um, this one I call Euclid solution. Um, if you like number theory, this might be the solution for you. Um, and this one is a little bit more subtle. Um, this one is actually one of my favorites in the book. Um, I find it extremely elegant. And if, I, if you look at it, um, you may not see what's going on because it's not obvious what's going on. But, but I think it is an elegant solution and, and, I, and I really enjoy it a lot. Um, and when you do like dig in to see why this works, it, it, it's actually quite, quite nice. And so uh, I like this one. I'm proud of it. Um, you know, you may have studied trigonometry in high school. Um, and if you did, you probably wondered what is trigonometry ever going to be useful for? And it turns out that one of the things that trigonometry is useful for is for solving FISBAs. Here's a FISBA solution that uses math.cosine uh, to solve it. Um, and, and, and so that's pretty interesting and a little bit unexpected. But again, it hints at some of this deeper structure that underlies the problem. Um, and also, as, as a person of taste, I, I use math.tau instead of math.py because uh, that's what I like to do. Um, so, so this one is, uh, this is a good one, too. This is my big number solution. So this one is probably uh, the most opaque. Um, that's a big number written in hexadecimal, and then we pick it apart with a regex and convert it to labels, and it's probably not at all obvious what's going on there, but, um, you know, it, it's a good opportunity for me to um, get to write an essay about hexadecimal numbers and Huffman codes and, and things like that. So um, this one... I don't want to say this one's elegant because I don't really find it that elegant. It's a little bit ugly, but there are some pretty interesting things going on behind the scenes. Um, and, and so I like it uh, from that perspective. This, uh, this is another one of my favorites. This might be my, my favorite overall. It's extremely elegant. There's no threes, there's no fives, there's no 15s. All there is is iter tools and lists. And like, I love iter tools. I, I'm like one of the biggest iter tools fans there is. And, and so this, um, again, this is, this is another solution that really speaks to some of the deeper structure that underlies the FizzBuzz problem. And yes, I know it sounds silly to talk about, you know, th this joke problem is having this deeper structure underneath it. Um, but to me, this is possibly my favorite of all the solutions because there's something that's very, clean and kind of uh, pure about it. And uh, I also like that it basically generates every FizzBuzz number going off to infinity, which, which is also um, a side benefit. So this one is possibly the most surprising. Um, so this is the random guessing solution. And you can see that we have uh, some loops there, but the key element is these calls to random.choice, which if you're familiar with Python's random mo module, is basically um, picking a random element of that list. Um, and so you might be thinking, how does picking a random element of a list get me the right solutions to FizzBuzz? Um, and again, the answer to that involves a combination of the underlying structure of the problem, as well as an understanding of how Python's random module really works and what it's what's actually happening when you call random.choice. So this, uh, it doesn't look neat and you know clean on the page necessarily, but still like it, it's a very surprising result. Um, and, and I promise all these work, like these, these are not like fake ones that don't work. These, these really do work. Um, and, and so I like, uh, I like this one a lot because it, it, it's really kind of a, a, a surprising result uh, if you don't, uh, if you haven't kind of taken it apart and, and understand how it works. You know, the, the, the ninth solution is the matrix multiplication solution. Matrix multiplication is pretty popular these days, so I wanted to get a solution in 
that involves matrix multiplications. Here we're using NumPy because NumPy is the way to do matrix multiplication. Um, and here I just have a weights matrix that I multiply by some feature matrix and you know, take the argmax and that gives me FISBAs. And so um, I'm not sure if this one's surprising or not. Uh, I, I like this one too. I think it's kind of neat and clean. Um, and it really sets the stage um, or sets the table for the 10th solution, uh, which is my FizzBuzz and TensorFlow solution, like the blog post. And there's a sick there. And the sick is that um, I don't work in TensorFlow. I work in PyTorch. Uh, the original blog post was written in TensorFlow because when I wrote it, uh, PyTorch didn't exist. So that was the only thing to work with. But these days, I don't even really know how to do TensorFlow. I only know how to do PyTorch. So um, I called it FizzBuzz and TensorFlow because that's what the blog post was called. But it's really a PyTorch solution. Um, and here, it's not uh, it's not a neat solution that's going to print out the answer, but I can show you how I modeled the problem and, and how I approached it. And that will give you a sense of how I think about approaching machine learning problems. Um, and so, you know, I needed to come up with a data model. Um, I mentioned before that I'm like a huge fan of iter tools. I'm also uh, like probably the world's biggest fan of named tuples. I use them everywhere for everything as much as I can. Um, and so if I'm doing a machine learning uh, project like this, you will most likely find me using some kind of name tuple for my instances. Here I have an instance which is represents some number. You know, it could be the number 15. It has some tensor of features, which is what we're going to feed into our neural network. And it has a label indicating what class is this going to be in. Is it, you know, as is FizzBuzz or FizzBuzz? So this is kind of the data model setup. Um, I also wrote a function to evaluate a model. Um, this is not very exciting. This is basically just saying, take the model, take some data, and make predictions, count how many are right, and maybe print them out. Um, so this is, uh, I included it here for completeness, but it's not very exciting, and it's not necessarily relevant to solving the problem. Um, in terms of constructing the data, you know, I, I talk about a couple different ways that you might want to get features out of these numbers for modeling. The one that I found that works best is actually to use the binary digits. So I, I can represent all numbers up to 1,024 with 10 binary digits. So that's what I do. Um, and then so that I'm doing, you know, good machine learning discipline, I train my model on the binary digits for 101 up to 1024. And I test the model on 1 to 101, which is what I want to predict. Um, so that's how I set up the data. Um, and then finally, you know, I set up a model that's basically uh, a neural network with a linear layer and a ReLU layer and then another linear layer. Um, I treat the problem as a four-class classification problem, again, where I have an as-is class, a fizz class, a buzz class, and a fizz buzz class. And I use cross-entropy loss to try and, uh, you know, make the right predictions. Um, and then I just train it for, you know, 2,500 epochs or whatever. Um, and it turns out that if I do this, um, I can get a model that, works pretty well. Um, it, I, I have in the past managed to get a model that gets 100 out of 100 correct. Usually, usually it doesn't. Um, and you have to really, it's very sensitive to the hyperparameters. Um, but you can get a model that gets about 90 out of 100 correct pretty easily. Um, and then, you know, one thing that's actually really interesting, um, and again, <laughs> speaks to the deeper structure of how the FizzBuzz problem works, as well as how binary representations of numbers work, is to really dig in and say, like, how does this model get it right? How does it learn to predict the right divisible by three or divisible by five or divisible by 15 from 10 binary digits? Which, if you think about it, it's not obvious, given 10 binary digits, how do I tell if something's divisible by three or by five or by 15? And so the way the model manages to learn that is actually, um, pretty interesting, and I, I won't spoil it for you, um, and also it would take me a long time to explain, but it is pretty interesting. Um, so that's the that's the tenth way, um, and uh, you know, I, I hope you'll agree that those ten ways were all actually pretty interesting, um, and I, and I want to thank you again for having me uh, come here. If I have, you know, intrigued you and you want to check out the book, um, if you use this link, fizzbuzzbook.com slash C slash chippy, the C is for coupon, then if you click on that link, it's it's a lean pub book, so it you can get a cheaper discount if you go there. Or if you just want to see the solutions, which is what I showed you, um, those are on GitHub, um, my name slash fizzbuzz, and you can see those for free all you want. Um, don't forget about Data Science from Scratch. The second edition is very, very good. Uh, I'm proud of it. It came out about a year ago. Um, you can find me on Twitter. 
my name at Joel Gruce. I'll tweet out these slides uh, once I'm done talking. And I have a blog at joelgruce.com that I very rarely update, like maybe once a year. So that's uh, that's what I have to say about FizzBuzz for now. So th uh, thank you again. Thank you for coming. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joel. Can we give Joel a round of applause in the chat? Uh, so do, uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, you do love name tuples. What's your opinion on data classes? So um, I'm not a huge fan of data classes for two reasons. Um, one is that I like immutability, and uh, name tuples give me immutability, and data classes don't. And I find that it's very rare that I actually need to use immutable data structures. And so um, I'm happier when I use immutable ones. The other is that name tuples are actually a really nice compact represent representation, whereas data classes are actually sugar around like classes. And so, um, you know, a lot of the times it doesn't matter, but uh, actually, you know, Alan NLP, we were creating these token objects. And with like a large data set, you'd be creating millions of these token objects. And it was taking up so much memory when they were classes. And then we switched them to name tuples. And suddenly the memory consumption shot way down because it had these compact representations. So I just, I, I tend to prefer them. Yeah, for sure. I, I just recently learned about the class type versus just like the one from like the collections library. And yeah. like we can, like you can add functions to it and like totally, total game changer. Uh, I think while we're still waiting for some questions to come in, uh, is there a favorite method out of the 10 that you sort of like liked sort of uh, figuring out? Um, the So the one about the infinite iterables with the, the iter tool cycle, that one when it, um, so I, like I said, I love iter tools and I love thinking about interesting ways to use iter tools. And so that one I was just kind of thinking about Whenever I see a Python problem, I always ask myself, is there a way I can use iter tools with this somehow? <laughs> um, and, and so that that was, you know, that was the same thing. I asked myself, can I use iter tools with this somehow? Um, and when it, when I figured that out, it was it was very satisfying. Um, the other one that, that I think really I enjoyed was the, the Euclid solution because um, when you dig into it and understand what it's doing and why it works, it, it's actually super interesting. Um, Awesome. Uh, so uh, do you have any calls to actions for community? I guess besides uh, use more inner tools? Um, you, you know, use inner tools, uh, use name tuples. I like them a lot. Um, you know, uh, check out the book and, and buy it if you're so inclined. Um, that's a call to action. Um, and, you know, just so here's the thing. FizzBuzz on some level is like kind of like a, a, a toy little problem, but there's actually a lot of like really interesting stuff that, that came out of thinking about it in, in kind of a serious way and trying to unpack it and trying to approach it from all these different angles. Um, and, and I think that's probably true in a lot more cases. There are a lot of problems that maybe seem simple on the surface, but when you start thinking about how can I approach this in a lot of different ways, um, there's actually some really interesting angles to it and some really interesting things you can learn about you know either Python or about the problem or about math or, or, or so on. So. Yeah, that's great. Digging into things is by far the best way to learn them. Uh, just so before we do let you go, is there like one thing that sort of sticks out at the top of your mind that you learned from this particular project? Um, one thing that sticks out. No, uh, I mean, so I've spent, I spent a lot of the past, call it five years, thinking about how do I, how do I use code to illustrate concepts, right? How do I use code to like teach things and show ideas? And so that's everything from like, how should I name my variables to how should I split things into functions? Um, and, and so, you know, re working on this book sort of reinforced for me a lot of this, that um, it really makes a huge difference from a pedagogical perspective, you know, having a function with bad variable names and having a function with good variable names and having a function that it's clear what it does versus having a function that is not clear what it does. Um, and so, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about those kinds of issues and, and, I, and I feel like this kind of reiterated to me that uh, it, it pays off when you approach that the right way. I think that's a fantastic place to leave it, like software pra software design best practices, software engineering best practices. Well, thanks again, Joel, for being on the Chippy live stream. And uh, we will also just a uh, link to your book so people can go find it with the coupon code. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank All you right. so much.